Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to our Moroccan hosts. Thank you very much. It's always wonderful to have an excuse to come back to Marrakesh. And to the WLPGA, I wish you the very best for a successful forum, and thank you to the Global LPG Partnership for um, making today happen. I want to thank you, first of all, all of you in this room for being in this room, because whether you realize it or not, uh, each of you and collectively uh, could be responsible for one of the most important breakthroughs in ending poverty, tackling climate change, creating a safer and more prosperous set of communities all around the world. You work on exceptional energy. I'm here to say to you that this exceptional energy um, is poised at the right time to contribute to our global goals. You are part of an energy transition, an energy transition very well described by uh, Monsieur El Hafidi. And of course, Morocco stands as one of the examples to all of us um, in terms of its own energy transition, not just in the way in which it has pursued renewable energy, but in the way in which it has really developed an integrated approach for an energy system or systems across the whole country, how that has become a linchpin, linchpin for development across the region, and also a very good example of how to build the institutions and the regulation and how to build up the capacity necessary in every country to be able to manage its transition. Gas, including LPG, will be an important part of that transition. And that energy transition is at the very heart of the jobs, the manufacturing, the water services, agribusiness, health, education, all of which are at the heart of the Sustainable Development Goals. They were agreed by all countries in 2015. Goal 7 calls for us to secure affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all by 2030. The most important words in that carefully negotiated text are for all. And if you think that in September 2015 in New York, 193 countries came together and agreed on a set of goals, then just three months later they came to Paris and agreed the Paris Climate Agreement with the commitment that we would put the world on track for a warming of well below two degrees centigrade. In fact, hoping to get closer to 1.5. What that Paris Agreement did to the global goals is make them all the more urgent, and what it did is lift up this global goal on sustainable energy and make it an absolute thread to pull up all of the other goals. In fact, what it does to the goal on sustainable energy is really focus in on the reliability, affordability, and the clean energy that all will have to have access to uh, by 2030 and by 2050, we need to be in a decarbonized energy system for the most part. These are promises we made to each other. Their consequence is that we are involved in a transition where at the end we will have decarbonized, decentralized, digitalized energy systems that serve everyone. But where are we? Well, two years later, because of the careful work carried out under the auspices of Sustainable Energy for All by many organizations, we know through the global tracking framework that a billion people still have no access to electricity and that just over three billion do not have access to clean cooking. 84% of those three billion live in just 20 countries in Asia and Africa. Those are with the largest access deficits. At the current rate of progress, if we just extrapolate a line out into the future, only 72% of the world's population will have access to clean fuels for cooking and technologies by 2030. So we can wait. We can wait for GDP per capita to finally get to that golden mark of about $14,000 per annum. And yes, everyone will have access to clean fuels for cooking. Or we can act. Last week, we launched at the General Assembly 
together with many other partners in a remarkable collaborative research exercise, a series of reports called Energizing Finance. We wanted to know whether, despite these remarkable agreements in 2015, financial flows had started to shift as the result of targets, government policy, new markets. We looked at international and domestic finance. We looked at public and private. We looked at development finance. We looked at charitable giving. We looked at what the countries do with their tax base. We looked at private investment. We looked at equity and debt. And we looked at the financial flows specifically for access. We found that the estimates are that for closing the gap in electricity, we need about $45 billion a year invested uh, every year until 2030. And we found that we were at about just under half of that in terms of committed funds or invested. That's not actually being dispersed and it's not reaching the people who don't have access yet. I mean, that's another speech for another day for another audience perhaps. But we could see that there is some progress. And then we looked at the figures for clean cooking. The bad news is that the numbers are so low that even if we take into account a number of difficulties in tracking numbers, we're not even in the same ballpark. We're not even close. The estimate from the IEA is that there's about 4.4 billion needed a year for clean cooking investment. That's what they call it, clean cooking investment. However, our research meant that we were only able to track $32 million a year for clean cooking investments in the 20 high impact countries that I mentioned already. 32 million against a ballpark figure of about 4 billion. And we're looking at the 20 countries where 84% of those without access to clean cooking fuels live at the moment. So the data is probably bad, but that means that somebody's not actually tagging and tracking the data, which means that it isn't a priority. And we're not even close, which means that we haven't yet created a market. We haven't yet understood fully the importance of people's access to clean fuels for cooking and for the technologies for clean cooking. What's really interesting is that a lot of the attention goes on the technologies for clean cooking. Less attention goes on the fuels. We took a deep dive into four markets to really understand what was going on from the bottom up. In Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Nigeria, a first-time assessment of the cumulative cost of meeting government targets for the cooking sector for fuels and technologies by 2030 when you add up the, the government's own targets and what it would cost in those four countries, we're coming to something in the order of $250 billion. And over 95% of the cost of meeting these targets is not in the stoves, but in the fuels. So why are we spending so much more disproportionate attention to a conversation about clean cooking technologies and much less relatively on what it would take to build vibrant markets for clean fuels for cooking. How come we don't have better data? So let's analyze the data and then let's act. I don't think we need to make the arguments again how much better this is for children's health, how much better this is for women's health, what it will do to economies when women's time is freed up from trying to access biomass for cooking when they could simply get access to clean fuels. I don't think we necessarily need to go through what the opportunity is for investment, the opportunity for jobs, the opportunity for advancement, what happens to a community when clean fuels for cooking arrive. We know that people live longer. We know that the incidence of disease comes down. We know that children can go to school and learn and that they are able to learn. So can we shift our mindset and can we collectively 
act. I'm here today because I don't believe that this is the time for incremental solutions in this country or that. Three billion people can be seen as a development problem or it can be seen as an extraordinary opportunity for wealth creation. It can be seen as a big problem. It can be seen as a very big market. The need is urgent and there's room for everyone to be a hero within it. There are signs of success. We know that it is possible to replicate some of that success and we know that it is possible to scale. Of course, we've all watched the example of India over the last few years, the aggression with which the current Modi government has gone after a target relentlessly, surprising itself with the speed with which it's been able to make progress. Now, of course, we need to understand whether that progress is really turning into lives improved, health statistics coming down. That's the true measure of development, but that comes in time. We can also look to Indonesia with the introduction of kerosene to LPG conversion in 2007. And that converted 56 million households and microbusinesses by 2014. At the same time, Indonesia's GDP per capita also increased by about 73%. So we know that countries that prioritize do make progress, India, Indonesia. We know that countries that put clean cooking at the top and pursue policies to really close the gap can see rapid progress. And between the period 2012 and 2014, India made significant progress, raising the clean cooking access rate by more than 8% per year. Angola, Bhutan, Maldives, Peru, all raised access to clean cooking by more than 4% per year. So it can be done. We also know that many countries show improvements where they also have natural gas producers, which suggests that there's some domestic availability making them or giving them an advantage. The achievements of this group of countries show that if the issue receives greater priority on the policy-making agenda, i.e. domestic access um, as the industry develops, maybe faster progress can be made in the future. So we know that countries can set priorities, make targets, use their own, uh, use their own uh, talents and skills in other areas to translate across. So let's study the examples, understand what's working and why, and then act. Today, energy access policies often concentrate on electricity provision, but then don't so much concentrate on access to clean fuels. So let's prioritize. Let's help policymakers understand how and why, sorry, and how to prioritize access to clean fuels recognizing that investments in LPG, ethanol, natural gas for cooking require long-term industry building perspectives. This is where you, WLPGA and GLPGP, can be essential agents of change. Prioritize, let's act. We also know that we have to address direct polluting fuel subsidies. We also know that we have to address consumer education and in fact, there's a lot more that goes with that consumer education, including access to consumer finance and the things that we know help markets grow more quickly. Ladies and gentlemen, the task, I believe, is to support and build vibrant markets for clean fuels and for those at the very bottom of the pyramid to work with governments from an industry perspective together with others and with the development community to ensure that through everything that we've learned about effective social programs, conditional cash transfers and other mechanisms, that their needs will be met with a bundle of services. So we don't try to reach the poorest of the poor with an education over here, with health over here, with a subsidy for clean fuels over here, that we bundle those packages and that we don't expect the market to take care of even the poorest of the poor, that this is going to be a public-private partnership at the very bottom of the pyramid. 
No matter where we are in the pyramid of those who don't have access to clean fuels, it's going to require that we work with financiers. And by financiers, I mean local banks to educate them about the size of the market opportunity, the introduction of appropriate consumer finance tools and products into the market, equity and debt. We have to work with the MDBs and the bilateral agencies that control enormous amounts of potential funding into the space. And there is education to be done. We are talking about a big market for clean fuels. We are not talking about accumulation of small projects for particular cook stove models. That is a shift in mindset. Private investors are going to have to be crowded in to markets that they may be reluctant to enter, to a segment of the population they believe is too risky, and to a section of the development challenge that they may not have paid too much attention to. And that is where you, as LPG industrial experts, have a significant role to play, because we can, from other areas of development, look at what has worked in supply chain financing, and distribution financing, and consumer financing to find new models. There are new business models, new financial models, new possibilities of blending. There is a pent-up or a growing pent-up demand of patient capital that wants to be part of a solution to allowing three billion people to cook cleanly, and they are a potential partner for this industry further down the line. Let me give you an example on this continent from the work of the Global LPG Partnership together with the government of Cameroon and the National LPG Master Plan that's been developed. On the back of that, a designated investment committee and a you know, prepared project investment pipeline of about 400 million euros you know, helps the government to, to see that its goal of providing access to LPG for 58% of the population is potentially feasible. The impact of that plan, if it were implemented fully, means that three and a half million households have access to fuels for clean cooking. That's 18 million new LPG users. That's 18,000 new jobs. And that's a very different argument than asking for some development aid to come from some taxpayer somewhere to make sure that everybody is given a clean cook stove. And we have still a residue of that approach to this problem in the system. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here because I believe we can't turn away from the data. Those three billion people and their economic success is hugely exciting in a, as an investment opportunity. And LPG is an essential part of that opportunity. I am here because the United Nations system believes that there are threads throughout the Sustainable Development Goals that, if pulled, can propel us more quickly towards success. And imagine that if we were able to create vibrant markets for clean fuels in the 20 countries where 84% of those 3 billion people live, we would be tugging at the goals on health, the goals on poverty, the goals on women, the goals on children's health, the goals on environment and deforestation and degraded land, the goals on energy and the goals on climate. My bosses believe that this partnership, together with others that are committed to the space, can actually do something that would lift everybody's game in the next five to seven years. So progress to date is just simply not good enough. I'm glad you're in the room but we've got to leave this room and do something different than we were doing before we walked in. I have a request to you and I have an offer. My request is let's organize ourselves better. WLPGA, GLPG, the Clean Cook Stoves Alliances and all of the other players in this space come together. Come together and see if we can in one platform, one coalition, one grouping, present ourselves uniformly to a subsection of those 20 countries, the ones that want to move fastest, and see if we cannot come up with, collectively, a plan for a vibrant market with all of the financing and the other pieces of the puzzle that we will need that can set real stretch targets for closing the gap in access to clean fuels. We can bring others to the table if we act together 
with a plan. What can we do as SE for All? Well, what I offer you in support of this, if this were possible, is to continue to marshal the data and the evidence and benchmark progress. We publish the global tracking uh, framework. We look at the regulatory indicators for sustainable energy together with the World Bank and have a sense of which countries have what in place to support markets and what would need to be improved for those markets to grow more quickly. And we publish Energizing Finance, which tracks the financial data into this space. And then there are things that we don't know. So let's get in a room and ask ourselves different questions. Maybe then we'll get different answers. And if we put different people in the room together with us, perhaps we'll get profoundly different answers. Let's work out what the research agenda is for the next five years. We will help. And then we will help you convene. We can create the neutral platform for the difficult conversations about what it's going to take to support those countries within the 20 that have the greatest access gap to make progress quickly. In two weeks' time, I'll be in Delhi at the Clean Cookstoves Alliance major meeting. I'm going to deliver exactly the same message, the same request, and the same offer of help to them. Finally, what we can do is tell stories. We can powerfully tell the stories of success so that the LPG uh, operatives and distributors in country X can see what was so transformative about what country Y did or what company X did and what company Y could do. So this is an extraordinary source of energy at exactly the right time and the right place. Should we be here? No. It's a moral outrage that three billion people have to choose between cooking cleanly and the, children of, and the health of their children. But this is where we are. This is where we stand. We have the data. We know who needs to be served. We have the technology. We have the fuel sources. Let's all act together. Thank you.